So, we are here. Finally, it's been announced for months, it feels like. But we are here. We're in the first part of our three-part series called When the Devil Knocks. And so, just let me say this up front before we get into the series. Some of you are like, why are we talking about the devil, right? Understand this, all right? We're not like praising the devil. We're not glorifying the devil. Like, that's not what kind of teaching this is going to be whatsoever. But what we're going to do is better understand our, our enemy so that we can better fight against our enemy, right? It's like in football. You watch film, not to be like, man, that team's so good. You watch it so you can know how to beat them. And so we're talking about the devil in this series so we can know how to fight back. And so I want to start with something kind of interesting. All right, if you were to ask me what the devil's like greatest deception, what his greatest trick like of all time is, what the, the biggest trick he's ever pulled off was, I would say that the greatest deception he's ever pulled was to convince so many people in this world that he doesn't exist. We may believe in God, but there are so many people who don't believe that there is an enemy out there, that there are forces of darkness, that the devil is as real as God is. And so I hope you'll understand that through this series, the devil is real. Right? He's not just some little guy in a red suit with like horns and a tail and a pitchfork that like sits on this shoulder while there's a little angel over here. Like, that's not who the devil is. All right, there is a spiritual battle going on every single day between the forces of good and evil. Right? And we know that our God is a God of, of light. Right? But the devil, it says he's the prince of, of darkness. We serve a God of truth. But Satan is the, the father of lies. Jesus came to give life, right? Life more abundant, but it says Satan came to bring death, right? To steal, kill, and destroy. Scripture actually teaches that our battle in this world is not against flesh and blood, right? It's not against each other. It's not against people. You're not in a battle with your parents, right? I know it may seem like that sometimes, but that's not the case. You're not in a battle against your, your crazy ex that just drives you insane, right? Our battle's not against flesh and blood. It's against the powers and principalities of the darkness in this world. And so that's why for three weeks we're going to dive in and we're going to learn how to fight against the evil one, right? How to fight back against Satan. So let me give you a little dark, dark story, back story about the darkness, right? A lot of people don't realize this, but Satan, right, Lucifer, he was an angel created by God, right, among several others, but Lucifer was actually kind of like the worship angel, all right? He was beautiful. He was full of wisdom and glory. The problem, though, came with this. The problem was that Lucifer became very jealous of God, right? God was getting the glory because he's God, but Lucifer wanted the glory for himself, and so he fell into pride and essentially pitted himself against God. Because as we know, God says he will not share his glory with anyone else because no one else can be deserving of his glory. And so when Lucifer wanted all the attention, God cast him down from heaven. He took a third of the angels with him, and those would be what we know as demons. They're the people that we do battle with today. So what does this matter to you? What you need to understand is this. You were made in the image of God. But the devil hates God. And so what that means is this. The devil will continuously come after you. It's not if you become attacked. He's already attacking you right now. And this series is designed to help you, to equip you. For those attacks, right? When the devil knocks, you know how to fight back. And so now I believe, I believe with all my heart, the devil will try and keep you from hearing this message. Try and distract you. There are going to be things that come up in the next couple weeks that are going to try and take you away from being at church. But I believe even more so than that, he's going to try and keep us from living this out. He's going to try and discourage you from living this out in your everyday life. So that's why I believe it's so important that we don't just hear God's word, but that we live it every single day. That we're not just hearers of the word, but doers. In fact, C.S. Lewis 
said this. He said, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. So when the devil knocks, we've got to be ready. We've got to have a response. And so this is a series, so let me show you where we're going to be going the next couple weeks throughout the month of October. So tonight, tonight we're going to talk about the quality of, of Satan, and we're going to look at how he is the deceiver. All right, Satan is the deceiver who attacks your mind with lies. That's what we're going to be looking at tonight. In week two, which week two is actually going to be on the 18th because we've got night of worship in between, week two may be one of my favorites because we're going to talk about how Satan is the accuser. He's the accuser who attacks your heart with accusations. And then the last week in October, and I'm really excited for this one, we're going to talk about how Satan is the destroyer. The destroyer who attacks your will with pride. But tonight, we're going to start with the deceiver. Satan is the deceiver. And this is what Jesus said about Satan in John 8, verse 44. He says, he was a murderer from the beginning. Not holding to truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Anytime he speaks, he's lying. So some of you may ask, well, how do I know if the devil's lying? If he's moving his lips, he's lying. He cannot speak the truth. He's always lying. And in fact, this was his first strategy, his first attack was through lies, was through deception, right? If we look at Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? Uh, through that story, tonight, we're going to see that he's actually not just lying, not just deceiving, but he's attacking the authority of God's word with his lies. His first attack was completely directed at God's word, and it's crazy interesting to me when you think about this, right? Think about it. There's so many different ways that Satan, as this serpent in, in Genesis, right, that was the physical form that he took, how he could have deceived Eve. There were so many different choices, but how did he do it? He chose to attack the word of God with lies. Think about it. He could have tried so, so many different things. He could have come up to Eve and, you know, maybe played on her, her insecurity if she had something. He could have went, it's my snake. If you don't think that's good, you should have heard it the first time this week when I practiced it. He could have come up and said, Adam doesn't really love you. That's how the devil sounds in my head. He's sick and tired of talking about your feelings. He'd rather be in his man cave. Like literally, because that's all they had was caves. <laughs> Adam liked it better when it was just him and the animals. He wants his rib back. some of y'all. There's so many different ways, though, that Satan could have tried to create questions, cause doubt in the mind of Eve. But what did Satan do? He attacked God's word. And he did it two different ways. And so if you're taking notes, the first thing that Satan did, the first thing that the deceiver did was the deceiver questioned God's word. Look at the first verse in Genesis 3. It says, he, talking about the serpent, talking about Satan, said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the God garden? Did God really say that? Notice he didn't deny that God spoke. Instead, he just questioned it. Right? That's the same thing that he does today. He'll try to cause questions to come up in your mind. Right? He plants those seeds of, of doubt. Do you really believe the Bible's true? You really believe that this is a book from God, right? Surely you're smarter than that. You don't really think that there was a creator who just spoke and everything came to be. Surely you're smart enough to know that everything just boomed and then the world fell together perfectly, right? God didn't really mean that for you, right? Not for you. Not in today's world. The Bible's outdated. Maybe hundreds of years ago this stuff would work, but this is 2023. We're past that. Besides, God loves you so much, right? If God really loves you, he'd let you do whatever you wanted. Did God really say that you can't do that? You aren't hurting anybody. This is your life. 
He questioned God's word. He begins to try and work on your mind and gets you to question what God has said through his word. And evidently, Eve started to question God's word. And let me show you why I believe this is true. Look at what God said. We go back in Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. He said, you may freely, somebody say freely. freely. He may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, you may eat freely from any tree in the garden, except this one, except the tree of knowledge of good and and evil. You can eat that tree, you can eat that tree, eat that tree, eat that tree, eat from that bush. Everything else is fine, just not that one. But then when Eve got into a discussion with the devil, she left out one key word. See if you can notice what she left out in Genesis 3 verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. She leaves out the word freely. Implying that maybe God was holding back. She's starting to question God's word. Maybe there is more out there. The thing that God said no to must be the very thing that I want. It must be the thing that's going to fulfill me and satisfy me. And so what happened? When Eve started to question the goodness of God, it made it easier for her to disobey the will of God. And so if you're taking notes... Write this down. When you start to question the goodness of God, it gets easier to disobey the will of God. When you begin to question his goodness, it's real easy for you to start to disobey his will. The moment Satan started to question God's word, Eve began questioning God's goodness, thinking maybe he was holding back. The deceiver questioned God's word. The second thing the deceiver did is this. He twisted God's word. The deceiver went, he, he just twisted it a little bit. Just twisted God's word. Because Eve says, we can eat from any tree, but this one, or we will die. The serpent says in verse 4 and 5, you will not certainly die. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. You know, that's exactly what Lucifer wanted, right? When we went through our backstory, that's exactly what he wanted, was to be just like God. But what's interesting is the way that he twists God's word. Because Eve was already made in the image of God. She was already a reflection of the heart of God, and yet the serpent said, let me come in and twist this up a little bit. Let me cause some doubt. Let me confuse you. Did God really say that? Because you can be like God if you do this, but she was already made in the image of God. But she began to get these questions and these doubts and the twisting was just getting to her mind. And this is exactly what Satan does to us today over and over and over again. He twists God's word. He causes us to question God's word. All right, let me show you what he does. He says God is love and that's true. God is love. But then he begins to twist it. says, he'll understand if you do wrong this one time. Do whatever you want, because scripture says, thou shalt not judge. So no one has a right to judge you. It's your life. You do whatever you want. God will forgive you anyway. God wants you to be happy, don't you think? Do whatever makes you happy. He attacks the authority of God's word. He takes pieces of scripture and twists them in our mind. Causes us to question God's authority. So here's what I hope some of you will understand. You're under attack. You're under attack. He's coming after your family, right? He's coming after your friendships, your mental health, your future. He wants to tear those things apart. You're under attack. You're under attack. So let me just say this. If I was like physically under attack, Right, like if somebody breaks into my house and like starts to come after me and Michaela, what do you think I'm gonna do? Well, let me let me tell you what I'm not gonna do first. I'm not gonna be like, oh man, I hope they don't come down here and knock on my door. I'm not gonna be like, oh Michaela, you better go do something. You better get them. Not me. 
What am I going to do? In that moment, let me tell you, I'm going to transform into some combination of like Rambo, Jackie Chan, Jason Bourne, John Wick. Man, I'm not kidding. I'm going to take a lamp and I'm going to turn it into some kind of martial arts weapon. Like, I may be my boxers, but you're going to see fierce like you ain't never seen before. Like, you hurt me, take me out, kill me. Now I'm your worst horror movie because I'm coming back from the dead to keep fighting you. Right? You're not going to hurt my family. And so what we have to realize is this. We're under attack. And so spiritually, we got to get serious and begin to fight back because in the same way, we are under attack every single day. We've got to get up every morning and say, devil, not today. You may have beat me yesterday, but it's not going to happen today. You're not going to destroy my family. You're not going to tear apart my future. You have no place here. You've got to begin to fight back in the name of Jesus. Because we know that the name of Jesus is the name above all names. The name at which every demon must believe. We fight in the name of Jesus. So you get up and say, I'm not sitting back today. I'm not tolerating this any longer. I'm not going to sit on the sidelines and hope for the best. Just wishing and saying like, man, is it ever going to get better? Is it ever going to stop? Am I ever going to be done with this? No, we're going to fight back and say, not today. Not this time. Not this Jesus follower because I fight back. I know who I am in Christ. I know what I have in Christ. I have the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwelling within me. Not today. You're in a battle. So recognize that. Because the good news is this. We battle not against flesh and blood. And because of that, we don't use earthly weapons. We have spiritual weapons. And Paul talks about that in Ephesians chapter 6. He said, you've got the armor of God. We've got a lot of defensive armor, right? We've got the helmet of salvation. You have the, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, right? To quench the fiery darts of Satan. You've got the belt of of truth, the shoes prepared with the gospel and the readiness of peace. But you've only got one offensive weapon. Our only offensive weapon is called the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Look at what verse 17 in Ephesians 6 says. It says the sword of the spirit, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So what I hope you'll understand is that the Bible it's not just some little book that teaches us how to be nice and kind to our, our neighbor. The word of God is your greatest spiritual weapon, right? You wield it against the forces of darkness. In every battle that you fight, it's the sword of the spirit. It's the word of God. So now back when Ephesians was written, there was two different types of swords that they would use. One was, was really big and heavy. You had to like swing it with two hands. This is the kind that David used when he defeated Goliath and went and chopped his head off, right? The big sword that he used like, ah! Another type was shorter, right? And this one was sharp on both sides. It was known as a gladius, right? Makes me think about gladiators. Because this one was used in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So when the enemy got close to you, you pulled out your gladius. And you went to fight. And so Hebrews 4.12 tells us that the word of God is like that. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Verse 12 says, For the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's how we do battle. It's how we do battle against the evil one. It's how we fight back with the spoken word of God. It's the sword of the Spirit. That's how Jesus did battle. When we look at the life of Jesus, right? The story of Jesus in the wilderness. When after 40 days and 40 nights of fasting... Right? He spends 40 days just seeking God, denying himself physical nutrition and just spending that time seeking God. And you know he's weak. You know he's weak after 40 days of fasting because, man, let me tell you, if I skip lunch, I'm going to be grumpy. I'm going to be weak. But he went 40 days without food. This was maybe his most vulnerable moment. And what does the devil do? He doesn't say, oh, I'll cut you a break. You're going through some hard times right now. I'll back off. That's when he attacks. When Jesus was weak and vulnerable, he attacked when Jesus was seeking God. Some of you say, I haven't been attacked in a long time. I feel like everything's going pretty good. Maybe it's because you're not doing anything. We can just get real honest. 
Listen, when you begin to do something for God, that's when the devil starts attacking. When you're being bold for your faith, the devil attacks. When you begin being generous with what you have and giving back, that's when the devil attacks. When you're glorifying God with your worship, with everything that you have, that's when the devil attacks. When you don't just come to church when you feel like it, but you're committed and you are the church, that's when the devil attacks. You begin serving and using the gifts that God's blessed you with. That's when the devil attacks. Jesus was glorifying God, seeking him with everything he had. That's when the devil attacked. And he attacked in waves, right? Look at, look at scripture. In wave one, he came up and he said, hey, Jesus, aren't you, like, you look hungry. It's been like 40 days now, right? Why don't you turn these rocks into bread? Why don't you turn these rocks into some donuts? We can sit down and chat. So why don't you turn those rocks into bread? And what did Jesus do? He drew his sword and he says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Satan left. But he came back, wave two. Satan says, Jesus, why don't you throw yourself down from this cliff? Because scripture says, and watch him twist scripture. He says, the angels will come and rescue you. That's true, but out of context. And so Jesus again draws his sword and says, It is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And Satan flees. He comes back again, wave three. He comes at him. He says, how about this, Jesus? Look over all the kingdoms of this world, and I'll give them to you. If you just bow down and worship me. And this is what Jesus did. He says, get away from me, devil. Get away from me, devil. He draws his sword, the living word of God, and says, It is written, worship the Lord your God and him alone. And the devil fled. And it says, The angels of God came and ministered to Jesus. It's the sword of the Spirit. Right? Psalm 119, 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your word is a part of me. Right? It dwells within me. How do you get to the place where, where God's word is hidden within your heart. You spend time in it. You study it daily. You begin to enjoy the nourishment from the word of God. That's how Jesus was able to deny himself the physical nutrition. Because he was living with the word of God. But if I can be really honest with y'all for a moment. The problem. The problem for so many of you is this. You don't even know where your sword's at. You don't know where it is. I could challenge you to go home and you'd be like, it's in here somewhere. It's in my bedroom somewhere. It's up on a bookshelf. Like, let me dust it off a little bit. I saw it the last time I cleaned up. I know it's in here somewhere. Or now you have it on your phone, which is really cool. And if it's not on your phone, it should be. But some of you know exactly where Instagram is, right? You could be blindfolded, open your phone, put in your code, find Instagram, load it up. You know where Snapchat is, where TikTok is, and the Bible app, it's somewhere in here. I know it's in here. It's in a folder somewhere. You don't even know where your sword is. And so listen, before the word can come from your mouth, before you can use God's word to fight back, it must be hidden in your heart. Because you can't fight with a sword that you don't have. You can't fight if you don't have a weapon. So before the word can come from your mouth and be used to fight back against the enemy's lies, you must know it. You must have it with you. It must be available and hidden within your heart. So what do we do? We seek God first. We open up our hearts to God in prayer. We seek him we open up the word. We let it nourish us spiritually. Because what does the word do? The word of God, it convicts us when we stray. The word directs us into God's will. The word comforts us when we're hurting. The word encourages us to become who we are in Christ. The word equips us to become the perfect will of God. The word reminds us that it's not about us, but it's about him. The word is the living bread. It's our spiritual nourishment. And so we feed on God's word. It strengthens us. It washes over us. It changes us to become who God wants us to be. And so guys, I would beg you, I would beg you to make this a part of your daily life. 
Every single morning, before you do anything else, click on the Bible app. Do a plan. Read a devotional. You say you're not good at reading, but like the app will read to you, so that's not even an excuse anymore. Let it read to you if you have to. Let it speak to you because the word is sharper than any two-edged sword. And so what do we do when we're in battle? We fight back with the word of God. Let me show you some examples, right? When you're depressed, why so downcast, oh my soul? I put my hope in God. When your family's under attack, no weapon formed against us will, profit, will prosper, right? As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. When you don't know if you can make it another day, God's word says, do not grow weary in doing good. For at the proper time, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up, right? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. When the diagnosis from the doctor is not good, things are looking grim. I will trust in the Lord with all my heart. I will lean not on my own understanding, but in all my ways I will acknowledge him and he alone who makes my paths straight. When you feel ashamed after what you did, after the sin that you've committed, after the past that you've lived, God's word says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. When I confess my sins, God is faithful and just and he'll forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So speak God's word. Say it out loud if you have to, right? Not today, devil. You're not going to rob me from what God has blessed me with. Not today. If you think for a moment that the devil's just some, some little guy, he's a harmless Halloween costume, then you probably also think that Jesus is just some soft little hippie wearing sandals carrying around a lamb. You can't have it both ways. God is love, but he's also righteous. He is full of grace, but he's also going to come back in judgment. And when he returns, right, this is according to, to Revelation chapter 1. John said this. Look at what verse 14 through 16 says. He says, his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand. And watch this. A sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all of his brilliance. What was God doing when he came back? He was speaking the word. He was speaking the word. Jesus was speaking the word. The sword was coming from his mouth, just like the Father did in the beginning when God spoke and created the world. The word was with God. The word was God. The word became flesh, and it dwelt among us. The word is Jesus. The word is Jesus. The devil is a liar and Jesus is the truth. Every time, every time you've ever sinned against God, it's because you believed one of the devil's lies. So whenever the devil tries to lie again, say, get behind me. Not today. I know God's word. It's written that this is who I am in Christ. This is what I have in Christ. This is who I am. You're defeated, right? I'm not fighting for victory. I'm fighting from victory because the devil's already been defeated. And so tell him to get behind me because he's a defeated foe. Because greater is the one who dwells within me than he who is in this world. And so tonight, maybe you've been fighting this battle. You've been using everything that you can think of but the word of God. And maybe the devil's lies have gotten in your head. Maybe the word of God has gotten a little bit twisted and you just need a fresh start. Maybe you're ready now to go home, dust off the Bible and say, this word is going to be hidden in my heart so I can fight back. I'm ready to fight back and stop going through the functions, stop getting beat day after day after day. And I'm ready to fight back. Well, then tonight, during this last song, come and pray. Get with the group and pray. Hold each other accountable. Get somebody to be like, hey, let's hold each other accountable. Let's read our Bibles every day and text each other and make sure, hey, did you read your Bible today? Yeah, did you? Because if you have somebody keeping you accountable, you're a lot more likely to do it. And so use this time. Get on your knees in prayer. Or just go before God and worship him for who he is. That because of the victory that he's already won, we can fight back against the devil's attacks. 
We know that the devil is already defeated. We already have the victory. We've just got to claim it. And so well, however the Lord is leading you, please respond. Don't let anything hold you back. Don't let the devil's lies creep in now and hold you in your seat. Because that's exactly what he wants. He would love nothing more than for you to walk back out the same doors you came in, just the way you came in. For you to leave unchanged. Go back into your schools. Go back and go through the motions day after day after day, never taking that step of faith for God. But tonight you can have that first victory. You can go before God. You can surrender your life to him if you've never done it before. You can get with a group and say, together we're going to fight back. We're going to be strong. And we're going to win. And you can walk out changed. You can walk out in victory. Because you know greater is he that dwells within me than he who is in this world. So during this last song, whether it's with a leader, with a group of friends, or just by yourself, you respond however the Lord is leading.